Chapter 20, Outside In. The American Outlaws Association, AOA, was officially established in 1965. A precursor group originated in Chicago in the 1930s and eventually spread throughout the East Coast, Canada, and Europe, with chapters formed in France, Norway, Belgium, Great Britain, Germany, Thailand, and Sweden. Recently, the AOA established chapters in Russia and Japan and boasts one of the largest motorcycle clubs in the world. The various chapters are grouped in the color-coded regions. The Copper region, which included North and South Carolina and Virginia, consisted of seven active chapters. Milwaukee Jack served as the Outlaws National Boss, and like the Vagos, the AOA implemented a rank-and-file structure replete with a boss, vice president, enforcer, and secretary treasurer. Prospective members first had to hang around the club for at least one year, demonstrate their commitment to the organization, and eventually obtain a club sponsor to prospect. That process could last at least six months or more. As Mongols full patches, we plan to become a prospective chapter of the outlaws composed of agents and informants. But the Mongols, angry that the outlaws had seduced us, insisted that the leaders of both clubs meet to discuss the politics of defection. Not that recruitment required permission, but tolerance was appreciated. The Mongols and outlaws, after all, still had to coexist in a small territory, and with a common enemy, it made sense for them to play nice. According to the club's strict rules, we needed five members and we only had 30 days to find a clubhouse. If we failed, we would be relegated to probationary status through the Northern Virginia chapter under Snuff's leadership. That wasn't going to happen. At first, we attempted to recruit the Mongols as Virginia Beach president, as well as the other member in the hangarounds, to be our fourth member. With him mostly at sea, he could fulfill a number without actually being a participant, but he refused. He was a devoted Mongol with no interest in defecting. He needed the identity, especially after losing his position with the Naval Special Warfare Development Group. Nevertheless, he had a prize war trophy he wanted to sell, a Russian-made automatic AK-47 that he found buried in a warehouse debris on an abandoned Iraqi military base. I could use the money, he confided in Gringo and offered to toss it in his bike for good measure. I plan to report it stolen anyway, he added and file a fraudulent insurance claim. He sold Gringo his motorcycle for $1,200 and reported a theft with the Fairfax County Police. But when the Mongols president learned that his insurance company had denied the claim, he offered Gringo two ballistic vests and another AK-47 in lieu of his immediate repayment. He should have known Gringo would never accept a bike with a lien. I was low-hanging fruit for the agent, the president confessed as he later pled guilty to selling illegal weapons to a federal agent. The Norfolk field office, nearly 80 miles from Richmond, attempted to find us recruits. Naturally, they wanted to avoid using another federal agent. The expense and the safety measures that had to be implemented each time the ATF dispatched one of their own into the field posed a bureaucratic nightmare. But they had a possible candidate, an informant and former drug dealer who had recently completed a prison sentence. He sounded promising. I arranged to meet him after work in a local bar. Tell him you're a federal agent, Gringo suggested. Explain you're infiltrating a biker club, but don't tell him which one. The lie was a necessary precaution. If we decided not to use the informant, the less he knew about us and our operation, the better. The informant arrived 15 minutes late for our date at Cheers. Tall and skinny, he had a deformed arm that flapped at his side like a wing, an alcoholic bloom and sweaty cheeks. A gold school necklace swung from his neck. Baggy pants hugged his hips, exposing red boxers. We were already in trouble. He extended his deformed arm in greeting, and the appendage reminded me of half-kneaded dough. This was Norfolk's finest. Electrical wire accident, he volunteered and slid onto the stool beside me. Reeking of alcohol, he ordered more shots and recounted in slurry detail several versions of his life story. I didn't believe a single word, but we had limited time to pull together a chapter of Misfits. How did he seem? Gringo asked me later, confused. But will he work? We're desperate, I said. Can he ride? Only a street bike. We decided to test the informant. We named him Claw to make sure his backstory contained no holes, no missing details that might incite suspicion and compromise the entire investigation. The outlaws always tested newcomers, 
wary of police informants and undercover operatives. They had protections in place, brutal initiation rites, interminably long prospecting periods, and verbal joust. We were actors, method actors. We couldn't pretend on the surface we were other people. We had to be our identities through and through. And if we didn't rehearse, didn't challenge the fake histories we created for ourselves, the outlaws would sense our deception and reject us like a foul odor. The details had to be perfect, flawless. Claw had to give the performance of his life and remember his lines. He made me nervous. I had always relied on my intuition when I infiltrated the Boggles. Now, for the first time, my fate rested on my team's deliverance. Tell him you're the ATF agent and we're the outlaws, JD suggested. Make up a backstory about how the two of you met. We'll grill him. Claw climbed into my car. His hands shook and he wore the same disheveled baggy clothes as the day before. Not a good sign. You ready for this, I asked. He nodded, stared into the street, pumped. Let's do it. His enthusiasm telegraphed his inexperience. No one I had ever known had ever been pumped to infiltrate a violent biker gang. How do we know each other? I quizzed him. We met in a bar. What bar? Where? We have to be specific. Bailey's. No good. That's in Richmond. How long have we known each other? A few months? At least a year. We met in Portsmouth at the Foggy Point. I took him there the day so we could memorize the smells, the menu, the neighborhood, just in case the outlaws demanded more detail. After several days, I asked him, think you got it? Let's do it. I took him to our undercover house to meet the bad guys. Gringo and JD dressed in prospect cuts, lounged on pink couches. Claw walked beside me, half my weight looking like a cutout from a cardboard poster. The agents suppressed a smirk, careful to stay in character. They spent the next few hours interrogating him, role playing, asking him how he and I met each other until Claw looked like he might expire from the pressure. How did he do? I asked Gringo later. He passed. Claw became number four. But we still needed a fifth member, and time was running out. Days before our deadline, the ATF relented and supplied us with Bobby, a qualified federal agent, medic, and experienced Green Beret with two completed tours in Afghanistan. Well groomed and soft spoken, he disarmed us with his calm demeanor and relaxed style, hardly the profile of a trained gentleman killer. Bobby oddly blended well into the biker culture. With our fifth member firmly recruited, it was time for the club of misfits to find our clubhouse. The outlaws had several in black neighborhoods, convinced that the police were less likely to harass them if they remained hidden in plain view. I searched dilapidated rental properties but settled on an abandoned tire warehouse in an industrial area of Petersburg. The building, tucked between boarded up businesses and gutted streets, provided perfect seclusion for drug deals, clandestine conversations, and unexpected night visitors. Situated one mile from the only Hells Angels living in the area, the ATF promptly wired our warehouse for sound and video. With one flip of a switch, we could record every conversation and transaction. Video streamed 24-7 as a safety precaution. Attorneys could never accuse us later of selective editing. Members gave us a housewarming gift, a pair of Nazi and Southern Confederate flags. We draped them above our bar and over the picture of Adolf Hitler. Inside a wall, the agents hid their government credentials. With our cast selected, we rehearsed. As vice president of our chapter, I developed plausible histories, reviewing the details of when, where, and how I met each of our agents. Our chapter boss, Gringo, and I pretended we were longtime dope traffickers who, for 10 years, smuggled shipments of marijuana from the west to east coast in those pre-9-11 days airport security rarely checked luggage. Eventually, I met Gringo's partner, JD. My adopted name, Chef, solidified my role as a former methamphetamine cook. The best lie was closest to the truth. I knew a lot about drugs, too much, and sometimes that knowledge backfired. Later, a hefty Italian outlaw from Florida would call my bluff after an impromptu visit to our clubhouse. He spilled over our bar stool, snorted lines of coke in front of us, and announced matter-of-factly that he had close connections to the Gambino crime family and we'd be wise not to fuck with them. I know what you're playing at. He wagged his pudgy finger in my face. His icy tone chipped at my resolve. Still, I shrugged, wiped down the counter with a wet rag, and quietly imploded. You're the informant. His finger traveled over the rest of us as one by one he picked us off. You fuckers are the federal agents. He meant to jar us, 
to gauge our reaction. If we bristled, registered alarm, even blanched, we would give away our identities. I didn't look at the other agents, didn't flinch, didn't want to give them any opportunity to struggle. The outlaw laughed and tapped his fingers on the bar to an invisible drum beat. I played along. How come I'm the informant? He shrugged, his cheeks pepper red. You know too much. He qualified after reflection. Definitely too much about the drugs. Bobby joined our mix as a mock mongo hangaround. We pretended he'd supervised me for three years when I worked his tree trimming business. Claw played himself a deformed drug addicted criminal. He blended well as our prospect. In addition to our government issued motorcycles, I purchased a van. My experience in the Vagos prepared me well for grit, sleep deprivation, hard concrete flooring, and open fields with rocks for pillows. The van at least provided shelter and thin carpet that wasn't stained with cat piss. I took comfort in the knowledge that if I closed my eyes, no one would step on my head or dribble my beer in my ear.